a novelist and a travel writer, continues to unfold with, uh, most recently, To a Mountain in Tibet, the story of his secular journey of mourning uh, to a sacred mountaintop, which is currently Amazon's top-selling uh, book, a travel book on Asia. If you, if you look at these sorts of things, as I tend to. Um, but Shadow of the Silk Road, published four or five years ago, um, is uh, nevertheless a kind of a culmination. Since they were on solo journey across the 7,000 miles of that story treasure, took him through many of the places of his earlier travels and his earlier books. Uh, China, which he had written about in Behind the Wall in 1987. Russia, which was the subject of uh, Siberi uh, um, in Siberia in 1999. The post-Soviet nations of Central Asia, which he wrote about in uh, The Lost Heart of Asia, 1994. Uh, Turkey, which he had written about uh, in his book Istanbul way back in uh, 1978, and one could, uh, could keep going with this list. One of the great pleasures of reading Shadow of the Silk Road is seeing how Thubrin manages not just the shadows of the route's ancient past, but the shadows of his own relatively recent passage through what are in many cases dramatically transformed uh, social, political, and economic landscapes. At times he meets up with people he had known from these earlier travels, and there's an understated novelistic complexity to those encounters, which along with the uh, vivid and particular evocations of place and the uh, special attention to language, uh, to translation, to miscomprehension, um, mark uh, all of his travel writing. I'm going to forego here the long list of honors and awards uh, that he's won. It's a very long list indeed. Um, except to say that, if I remember correctly, Mr. Thubrin was appointed commander of the British Empire by the Queen at the same ceremony uh, with um, the former rock star Rod Stewart and the, uh, and the actor Hugh Laurie, the star of House uh, on television. So apart from being a descendant of John Dryden, the inventor of modern English prose, uh, and one of the world's most distinguished writers of English prose today, he's also a bona fide celebrity. Uh, and we're most fortunate to have him uh, here. So please join me in welcoming Professor English's very generous interview, um, uh, I should say, um, words about me. Um, I feel I should start with an apology and uh, also uh, some kind of warning. The apology is that in spite of this promising looking map of this um, screen beside me, I have just one slide to show you, and that's a map. Um, the, the warning comes in the words of the writer Dorothy Sayers, who had this to say about beating her fellow authors. What we make is more important than what we are, especially if making is our profession. People are always imagining that if they can only get hold of the writer himself, and so to speak, shake him long enough and hard enough, something exciting and illuminating will drop out of him. <laughs> but it doesn't. <laughs> or with the terser words of Margaret Atwood, if you like pate, don't bother to meet the duck. <laughs> well, well, fortunately, um, this afternoon, um, we are talking about the greatest and most influential travel route that there's ever been. The Silk Road, I should say, was not um, one route. It was a whole series of arteries and veins that collided and divided across the breadth of Asia uh, for more than a quarter of the length of the equator. <clears throat> so if my own journey that I'm going to describe sometimes also diverges from the, uh, the principal route of the, of, of the Silk Road, that is exactly um, what it was always doing. Um, traders uh, through the centuries were deflected from one part of the route to another by war, by ecological conditions, and sometimes simply by the necessities of trade. <clears throat> the Silk Road, I'll talk about it briefly before describing my journey, 
um, began officially in the second century BC, but probably long before that, in fact. Um, and there were times when it absolutely reached its height, um, when the great Han dynasty in China in the east was echoed by the Roman Empire in the west, in the, at the height of the Tang dynasty in the seventh, eighth centuries in China, or at that strange time in the 13th, 14th century called the Mongol peace, which sounds self-contradictory, but in fact there was a unified Mongol power across almost all of Asia, uh, which created um, a unification and a, a, a safety, curious enough, in traveling. And in those days, um, the camels, camel trains were sometimes literally a thousand strong, uh, passing out of China, of course, not just with silk, but with ceramics and lacquer work. And interestingly, um, with a, a more influential trade in many ways, in the first oranges and apricots that were known, the first mulberries and rhubarb, and the original, of course, of so many of the flowers we're familiar with, roses, camellias, azaleas, peonies, chrysanthemums, all coming out of China along the Silk Road to the west. Coming back the other way, especially in Roman times, um, you find glass and gold, um, unfortunately, it's slaves, uh, silver, um, and coming up from the south, uh, a, a huge trade. Indian trade in spices and gems. Out of Persia and Central Asia, you find the vine and the fig tree, um, the, the original ones, olives, and uh, another horde of vegetables and herbs. In fact, everything went along this route at one stage or another, from amber and frankincense to rhinoceros horn, um, and even a caged lion or two were known to have traveled along it. Of course, this invisible river, um, took not just goods, but inventions. Um, if we think of just printing, paper making, the magnetic compass, uh, and numerous other Chinese inventions, uh, took this road westward. And as goods continued, people lost track of their origins. So they not only accrued a higher value, but they accrued a sort of mystique sometimes they would literally take two years to reach their destination and nobody knew where they were originally from. Uh, the Romans, for instance, imagined that silk grew on trees. <laughs> and above all, this had an enormous reach um, so that Chinese silk turned up in the hair of a 10th century BC Egyptian mummy and in the graves of Iron Age Germany. In the Taklamakan Desert, the great Seer Desert of northwest China, um, seals appeared in engraved with the images of Zeus and Pallas Athene. And I'm sure all those who've seen the exhibition have been astonished to find on that 2,000-year-old that corpse of what is probably a Sogdian merchant, uh, there's embroidered um, clearly um, Greco-Roman cherubs um, with in gladiatorial guise with, with um, shields and, and spears, together with Persian motives of, of bull and goat. From the second, century, from the second millennium BC, um, many of the fabrics echo those of early Celtic people. And much later, we find in Tang Dynasty China that the courtiers are buried with gold Byzantine coins in their mouths, and they would wear those coins um, in court ritual, still inscribed with the emblems of Christian kingship. And of course, when everything else is disintegrated into those graves, those graves, the Han Dynasty ones, 2,000 years old, we find so often that silk is what has remained. Um, the Chinese discovered in silk an extraordinary tensile strength. If you were to lay two cables side by side, even now, of the same diameter, one of silk and the other of steel. It's the silk that would be the stronger. One might imagine that this was a, a fragile fabric, but you can find a little cocoon from the silkworm and stretch it out for more than a mile and a half. And you could say that that very tensile, delicate, yet strong fiber was a, a sort of metaphor for the Silk Road itself. It was always so that at certain stages of history, an event at one end would vibrate like an electric current along it and produce uh, a, a change um, all along its way. So that the pressure of tribes, for instance, 
on the East China Sea might, uh, by a sort of relentless chain reaction, release the Huns over Europe. A disaster cannot happen in Asia, Cicero wrote, without the Roman economy being shaken to its foundations. Well, my journey, um, which began, sorry, I've got which began here in Xi'an, um, I went 7,000 miles by local bus and truck and train and whatever I could find. Um, only occasionally, I'm sorry to some of the romantics among you, only occasionally by camel. But um, it was um, a journey from Xi'an, which is of course the very oldest, um, or one of the oldest of the Chinese capitals in the Tang Dynasty in the 7th, 8th centuries. It was undoubtedly the greatest city in the world, a population of 2 million, surrounded by 22 miles of walls. Then here, up what they call the Gansu Corridor there, to Jiaguan, about there, sorry for the shaky pointer. Um, Jiaguan, between Lanzhou and Dunhuang there, was the end, of the traditional end of the Great Wall in many Chinese periods. <coughs> Within the Great Wall was the Celestial Empire, it was all civilization to the Chinese. Outside to them was barbarism. Beyond there, you, you eventually come, sorry, I'm this eventually come to Dunhuang there, which, as many of you know, is the great, huge cave sanctuary, cave complex, um, full of um, magnificent treasures, unearthed eventually or borrowed or stolen, you might say, by Oral Stein, and now um, in the West. And at Dunhuang, um, there was an option of going, that's the North Silk Road there, and this is the South one here. The North one now is quite well travelled. The south one, rather perversely, was the one I wanted to take um, and travels here. You're not allowed on it, really. The Chinese turned me off the bus um, that I had that was going more or less in that direction. I was turned off by plain, plain clothes police. I got on a similar bus a few hours later. Nobody seemed to notice. So I eventually went through these mountains here and arrived on the edge of the Taklamakan Desert, which is perhaps the most inhospitable desert on Earth. Unlike the Sahara, absolutely nothing grows in it. Marco Polo uh, reported that it was filled with demons and strange nocturnal noises, which is actually the shifting of the sands in unusual temperature changes. And Tatlamakan itself, in a local dialect, means you go in, but you never come out. <laughs> well, um, about here, oops, I keep doing this, sorry, there we are. Um, about there, um, you're a thousand miles within China, and yet already you realize the political map is false. You are with Chinese people who are not Chinese at all. They are the native Uyghur people who are Muslim, um, Turkic, uh, a very different culture, even physically very different. And this is something I encountered again and again over the Silk Road that what looked like a national boundary of well-defined uh, ethnic uh, communities uh, was nothing of the kind. And it was there in Chechen that I got caught up by, caught by the Chinese and in uh, quarantine for the SARS virus, um, uh, which was miserable, but got out later and got onto the assault platform uh, just above the city where many of the mummies, uh, the most famous mummies were were dug up. I found myself looking down into a pit, I remember, and there apparently were, uh, was a family, family group, so about 15 people um, huddled together. They were uh, about uh, a, thousand, a thousand years BC, but they were perfectly recognizably Caucasoid. Um, they looked like really um, statues um, huddled together. And it was on this plateau that um, for instance, the famous Ur David, uh, perhaps the most celebrated of the mummies, um, which is in Urumqi, was discovered. And a very strange, um, a very strange tomb in which there was a shamaness supposedly buried. In the cave ceiling above her was a baby had been immersed, um, with uh, the mucus and tears were still clear on its cheeks. Above it was a young woman dismembered 
lying still on blood-stained clothes. Nobody quite knows what the meaning of this is, but in the Chinese annals of about the almost the turn of the millennium into that AD, we find there's the reports of huge barbarian people with flaming red hair, and green eyes, and so on. The Chinese reported them as terrifying. Um, but then these accounts fade out of Chinese history. And yet now, for the last 50 years or more, these mummies have been appearing um, out, out of the Chinese desert, uh, several thousand of them probably scattered, many more of them have been preserved. Um, probably some 500 or more have been preserved, but there are many others which have simply been dug up by local, by local uh, salt panners or, or vandals and, and strewn about. Um, and these mummies, of course, um, are joined now by the beauty of Xiaohe, which you see in the museum here. There's another beauty who preceded her for a while called the beauty of Lolan. And she is in a room, she, she looks very much the same, except she's not coated in white pigment. Uh, she's almost sort of burnt to ebony. But there seems to be a kind of posthumous beauty contest going on between her and the beauty of Xia He as to who is more beautiful. But um, the Uyghur people, who are the inhabitants now, the native inhabitants of this area of China, um, are have adopted the beauty of Lolan as their sort of national symbol. Um, they claim that this is their inheritance, that their people were there before the Chinese, and this is what makes it such a, a politically sensitive area. I eventually get to Kashgar there, the great um, city which has now been joined by rail to, main, to the Chinese hinterland and is responsible for a kind of ethnic swamping, you might say, of the Uyghur people. Then a complete change here. You get into Kyrgyzstan, which is a sudden, sudden mountainous ascent. The early Chinese traders said, call, would it call the passes. They had to negotiate literally big headache passes and small headache passes. Um, and uh, little Kyrgyzstan there, just after the outbreak um, or the splintering up of the Soviet Union in 1991, was, um, was a momentary little sort of Switzerland, little democratic Switzerland in the heart of Asia, where the old communist rulers had really hung on to power by another name. That's stopped now. And this, um, this little country um, has, um, unfortunately, beginning to fall apart between a, a sort of Soviet ties north, you might say, and a more Islamic south. And this is typical of all this area, Uzbekistan here, where I went eventually to Samarkand, Gorsa, and to Bakhala, these great caravan cities. One finds there's a hopeless ethnic mix here. Um, it's impossible really to separate these, these lands um, by the simple national borders that are apparently there. In Samarkand, of course, you see the tomb of Tamerlane, um, which is an extraordinary thing to look at, so like seeing the tomb of Genghis Khan or Attila. Um, and it, it's quite um, disquietingly beautiful. Um, I had intended here to descend into Afghanistan. This was in 2003. And I went to Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, and went and saw the BBC offices there to find out what was going on. Um, this was off, well after the US-led invasion. And um, as I went into the office, I found that um, the reporter there was actually interviewing um, one of the warlords. A war had broken out in exactly the places I was wanting to go. And he was talking to a terrible Uzbek thug called General um, Abdul, Abdul Rashid Dostum, um, who was saying, well, um, we're having a bit of a con confrontation with um, uh, uh, Atta Muhammad. That was his uh, tajik rival. Um, and um, we're, 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 we're negotiating for peace, but, but he's not being very helpful. And you could hear the gunfire in the background as he was talking. So, and about an hour later, they got hold of Arthur Muhammad and said, you know how things are going in your negotiations with General Dostum? And he said, well, General Dostum has been a little bit, um, little bit difficult. We don't seem to be... And you could hear the gunfire in the background. <laughs> so, in a very short time, exactly the villages and the roads that I was planning to travel were littered with corpses and tanks. And I had to delay um, for a year 
which I did. So half the journey was done in 2003, the other half in 2004, when I went back rather pedantically at the same time of year to the same place. And crossed there into Afghanistan. Now that um, blue squiggle there is the great Oxus River, the Amodaria. And you would think that here at last was a real national boundary that must uh, delineate uh, an ethnic reality, Afghans against uh, Uzbeks, say. But actually, it, there's no difference at all. From early migration, it's Uzbeks and Tajiks to the north, Uzbeks and Tajiks to the south. I arrived in Mazar Sharif, which is in the northern part of Afghanistan. Um, after crossing over the border, they didn't seem remotely worried about my crossing over. They just thought I was a bit mad. The um, Afghans uh, were very welcoming at that time. And, uh, but in Mazar Sharif, I wanted to cross over uh, the north part of Afghanistan there to Herat, the great city. And um, I was told I had to take two bodyguards with me if I was to do so. And there was a sort of auxiliary police force which had been assembled. And I went to visit this auxiliary police force when I looked at the bodyguards, I thought it was really just safer to go without them. <laughs> so, so I had, a, had found a nice Tajik driver and we, we sneaked out of Mazar Sharif before dawn, leaving them behind, I'm afraid, and um, began to go west across the desert. This, um, this is an area where you are aware always of these, the extraordinary Afghan dignity. Um, you know, they've suffered more than a million dead and four and a half million displaced. But these are the people you pity at your peril. An earlier traveler said of Afghanistan, here at last is Asia without an inferiority complex. <laughs> well, across that desert there um, was pretty bitter. Um, we picked up an old man as a guide and went across the dasht -e part of the desert. And some of you probably remember that after the Afghan, the um, US-led invasion of Afghanistan, the Northern Alliance cornered 3,000 Taliban fighters in Kunduz. And um, these ones, they imprisoned, they let go all the Afghan Taliban, they just went back to their villages, but the foreign Taliban, um, Saudis, uh, Pakistanis, and so on, they loaded onto container lorries and took out to the Dashkaleli Desert. Those who hadn't been suffocated, they summarily executed. And the old man said he saw hands and feet sticking out of the desert sounds. Um, we went across fast. Um, the United Nations have asked permission to uh, inspect this area, but the warlords have refused them uh, any kind of protection, and so the matter has vanished. There's just that desert with, with half, half buried bodies in it. I eventually got to a little place there um, called my Mana, and um, it was there that my driver refused to take me any further. We hadn't seen any foreigners for many days, and um, there had been five um, in that area, the med five medicines or frontier workers, but they had been murdered a few weeks before. So we flew, um, I flew rather alone to hear that. And here again, there's one of these odd odd um, uh, phenomenon, uh, which again and again I found on the Silk Road, that um, there's a divide there which you wouldn't know, um, which was between the Turkic and the Persian worlds, the Turkic and the Iranian worlds. The Uzbek population fades away, and you're with an Iranian people. By the time you've got to hear that, they're speaking a purer Persian, a purer Farsi, than they say they are in Iran. Here at a great city, um, much bigger than in the 12th century than, say, Paris, which was the biggest city in Europe at the time. You go over the border into Iran, and along there, um, which is now a very desolate area, it was um, laid waste by the Mongols in the 12th, 13th century in particular, and that area of Khorasan. Beyond Tehran, um, you slowly approach um, the, the border between Iran and Turkey up here. But here again, about there, um, you find suddenly everything changes and that you no longer hear Persian spoken, you hear Azeri Turkish, and you realize that a quarter of the Iranian people are not Iranian at all, they're Turkic speakers. So again, there's this sort of false border. And then you arrive at here, which is 
beyond the Caspian up there is Lake Arumye, the much the biggest, um, much the biggest lake in Iran, which is um, called Lake Arumye. It's very, very shallow, about 30 feet of its whole vast length, lapping to the Turkish border, and home just it's so saline to just a very few um, rather uh, low forms of life, I suppose, the sea crabs and sea worms, and that whole vast sea um, home to just a, a few primitive life forms, a bit like a political party conference, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, over here you think, ah, now that's a border that's definite, Iran and Turkey, that's got to be a definite border, but no, it's Kurds to one side, Kurds on the other. Um, this, in 1999, um, they had become, uh, 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 this sort of guerrilla to Kurds had become active again. Um, they weren't after me, they were fighting the, the Turkish army, and eventually arrived skirting the Syrian and Iraqi borders to the end of the Silk Road in the classical period there at Antioch. Antioch's now the little Turkish town, well, not so little, the Turkish town of Antakya. And just beyond, you come to the end of the Silk Road itself, which is um, a little port called Seleucia Perea. And there's nobody there. It's just a silted harbor, a few columns fallen into the sea. And this was the place um, completely abandoned from which the silk finally took its journey west over the water and from which St. Paul set out on his first missionary journey westward. Well, you might ask in what spirit um, somebody undertakes a journey like that. And I only can say there's other romanticism built up around travel writers, at least in England. And, uh, but what you're actually doing is, much like any journalist is doing, you're looking for copy. Um, what you fear is not that something bad will happen during your journey, but that nothing will happen at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you travel, and you um, uh, just, uh, it's almost as if there are two of you going. There's the one that's traveling, and there's the one that's sitting on his shoulder who's going to write about it. Mm -hmm. Just as the one who's traveling is being shot at and beaten up and so on, the one who's sitting on his shoulder is jumping up and down excitedly saying, this is good copy, we can use this. <laughs> uh, encouraging you to do stupid things. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other equipment, I suppose, that I've traveled with, uh, other than a small rucksack, has been uh, language manuals. It always seems to me that even if you make a a small effort to learn the language of the country you're in, um, it makes all the difference, even if it's a few courtesies. So I've struggled all my life with Russian and Mandarin um, in, to <coughs> attempt to, to discover what the lives of ordinary people are like there. Um, I always had a bad time because I, in Iran in particular, because I tried to learn Farsi, just a few phrases. Everybody looked at me completely incomprehension as if I was in sort of a Martian. And um, I was reminded of um, a, a journalist called e Eona Robinson in England, who um, just after the war encouraged people to learn just one word even of the foreign language that they were going in the country they were going. Encouraged a friend of hers in particular to learn the word Dembelazi, which she was going to Greece. And in Greek, Dembelazi just means it doesn't matter in the least, basically. So this friend of, of hers traveled uh, saying, with great success, it doesn't matter in the least, it seemed to fit all sorts of occasions, it was very popular, <laughs> until of course Nemesis came as it always does, um, in this instance on Easter Sunday morning, when people began sort of bumping into her and saying something, she imagined that they were apologizing for bumping into her, so she kept saying, they realize it doesn't matter in the least, but probably as some of you know, on Easter Sunday morning, the Greeks have a custom of greeting one another with the words, Christ has risen. <laughs> <laughs> so to be told it didn't matter in the least, it was in the <laughs> These are the perils of knowing too little of a language. Well, in conclusion, um, at, at Sion, where I stood before these terracotta warriors, with which I'm sure some of you are familiar. Um, you're looking at a part of the grave of the Emperor Qin, who gave his name to China, who is buried under a huge mound there, 
um, floating, it, it is thought, on a sea of mercury, a floating coffin with his slain wives beside him, and a facsimile of his empire surrounding him, the cities in precious stones, the landscape in bronze, and over the cave ceiling above him, all the constellations that were known to the Chinese at the time, and there were more than 2,000 picked out in pearls. And yet, this man Chin was probably not Chinese at all, probably a barbarian from the Silk Road area to the northwest, and so was the Yellow Emperor, the mythic progenitor of the Chinese people, and so indeed were the founders of many of the great um, unifying dynasties of China, uh, the Yuan, even the Tang Dynasty, uh, not ethnically Chinese at all. The Central Asian nations, those Stans, um, which I mentioned, uh, they were created by Stalin quite artificially in the mid-1920s. Uh, he didn't want, of course, to have a unified Muslim power at the bottom of the Soviet Union facing the Slavic North. So he artificially documented, doctored, or doctored their languages, even their histories, and um, created nations which, when the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, became sort of genuine nations and were having to hunt and fight for their identity. They were, above all, trying to discover individuals um, who would give them a kind of dignity. The Uzbeks, of course, went for Tamerlane, who wasn't a, a, the great conqueror, who, who wasn't an Uzbek at all. He was a pure-blooded Mongol of the Balas clan, but they adopted him, and now you see nothing but, you know, Tamerlane streets, Tamerlane laundrettes, Tamerlane everything, um, for this man who um, was uh, a Mongol. And even the Iranians, you might say, know or honor less of their real history than their sort of mythical history as produced in the great Shanana epic. The Kyrgyz, um, who I traveled with briefly there, um, they too have an enormous epic called Manas, which is longer than Mabalata, the Odyssey, the Iliad combined, goes on forever, and celebrates uh, a pre-Islamic hero called Manas. And they imagine that this is their national identity. They even imagine they've got his tomb there. I found his tomb, and uh, he was being worshipped with Islamic worship. And um, when I looked at it, o over the top of the tomb that I couldn't read it, I discovered later, was a Kufic script so saying that not that this was the tomb of Manas, who may not have existed, but this was the tomb of a woman, of um, a woman called Kyatisyat Katkun, who was the daughter of a 14th century Turkic emir. But none of these things, of course, matter to those who believe in their nationhood. Um, it's as if those sort of beliefs, those myths, those desires, stream, uh, sort of swimming in, in their own stream of time. And I think if the Silk Road had anything to teach me, it was, in the words of Ernest Renan, that a nation is bound not by the real past, but by the stories it tells itself, by what it remembers, and what it forgets. Thank you very much.